The opinions of the guests and host are their own and do not represent the opinions of Ironclad, the Border Patrol, or the Department of Homeland Security. But when you peel back the onion, you look at the level of tradecraft, these cartels don't operate with a Born to Lose tattoo stamped on their forehead. These people are living and breathing in every day. And if you and I were talking to them right now, and I talk to them all the time, they are at war. And from their perspective, and their perspective matters, they are concerned about their rival, Vince. They're not concerned about the United States government because we've done nothing to them and they're not concerned about the Mexican government. And this is why you see a continued evolution in violence in Mexico and in deaths in the United States. We cut through the partisan talking points. We're not interested in perpetuating fear. We're interested in seeking truth, hearing what's really going on on America's borderland. Welcome to Borderland and Ironclad Original. Today, we're bringing you an interview with expert and Newsmax border correspondent, Jason Jones. He has a long career with law enforcement. He is a retired captain from the Texas Department of Public Safety's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. He has supervised numerous human intelligence operations and spearheaded investigations targeting Mexican cartels' leadership. Jason provides insight on the dangers and impact the Mexican cartels have presented to both Americans and Mexicans. His mission is to designate cartels as a foreign terrorist organization in order to stand a chance at stopping them from infiltrating our country. Here's our conversation. If you don't mind, for those who are watching and listening and probably don't know, probably uh, been been hiding under a rock or something like that and don't know who you are, if you don't mind kind of giving us a, a brief bio and an introduction of yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jason Jones, I'm a retired captain from the Texas Department of Public Safety's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. I spent 24 years in law enforcement. I've been stationed on that border uh, from 1999 out for two years in El Paso, Texas, as a Texas Highway Patrolman. I was an undercover narcotics agent, 1,200 miles on the other side of it in Brownsville, Texas, um, as the Zetas first came online. And uh, then I was a lieutenant in Laredo, Texas, as the war really kicked off between the Gulf and the Los Zetas and the hyper-violence that we were stunned by. Uh, moved all around the state nine different times during my career. Uh, after Laredo, uh, as a lieutenant, I uh, promoted to captain, went to Austin headquarters, ran the state intelligence center, one of the largest intelligence centers uh, for a local or state law enforcement agency in the country, totally independent from the federal government and paid for by the great state of Texas. And then I, I ran the Texas Rangers Cross Border Operations Center. I was not a ranger, but because I worked closely with the U.S. intelligence agencies, uh, doing so many things down in Mexico, rescuing migrants and uh, Mexican citizens from the Los Zetas who had become absolutely hyper violent. That's why I took over the state uh, border security operations center. Um, and I was very honored to do it because, you know, the Texas Rangers don't let anybody in their programs. And uh, for the chief of the Rangers to have me, I actually you know, be in charge and command one of his programs. It was a great honor, but we rescued and saved a lot of people. And I'll be very frank with you. Uh, I was pissed off when I retired that the American public were being lied to and not being told what was really taking place with the evolution of these cartels, what they were, had become, but most importantly, how they were impacting this entire country. And so I went public and uh, my whole theme has been, and has not changed since 2016 is that um, I've been trying to get the cartels designated as foreign terrorist organizations. And I'm a firm believer that if we illuminate it, we can eliminate it. And so I go to the border every other week and I show the American people what's happening. And now what's really happened over, you know, over time, Vince, is that I've got so many border patrol agents, so many people in the private sector, they send me constant videos to illuminate the cartels operations, both in Mexico, uh, at our border and in our own country. And I'm very humbled by that somehow. I went from a law enforcement officer into journalism, never the plan, just so you know. It's funny how things work out in life. And uh, today I'm Newsmax's national border correspondent. And I was offered a great gig, which I didn't even know I could be offered such a job. And uh, I'll be very frank with you, though. My specialty, what I do is I embed with law enforcement around the country and I show through their lens what they're going through and what they're up against. And I think that that's the closest way we can bring where the American people are here where law enforcement and intelligence agencies are here and bring that gap closer together. That's my goal. Yeah. And so every day, um, that's what we're doing. I love that. You know, <clears throat> this subject, the border crisis, immigration, and, you know, drugs, 
all of this topic kind of falls under the same tree, just different branches. And, it, and, and some people get confused by it, by, by, you know, if they're against illegal immigration, you know, then they kind of don't want to listen to the rest of the conversation. And the other side, if they want open borders, then they don't want to hear anything else. And so we've kind of created, this subject itself has kind of created a division in our country. And the big reason for me wanting to do this podcast was to be able to have many different, different uh, thought leaders in the space to hopefully, I believe, with the information, the education of this subject, we start bringing more people aligned in the center. I think we start to have more people understanding and not be fearful of the information, but yet learning and understanding like, hey, one, as a country, United States, we want uh, legal immigration, but two, we also want protecting our nation. We, you know, we want to protect our people. And so in this conversation, because your expertise is, is, is fundamental with, with the cartel situations and, and how those can kind of disrupt America and, and cause chaos, um, you know, we'll dig into that, but really just wanted you to know the goal of this whole show is hopefully to educate people on these subjects. And since you're subject matter expert in this field, this is what we will talk about today. But like, just so you know, for full transparency, we've talked to immigration lawyers, we've talked to educators, and, and everyone has their own perspective and their belief of it. And what's been really fascinating is that I think everyone, everyone can agree so far that we've talked to is that they still want a safe country for their kids, for their family, you know? And when you say that, it's like, okay, well yeah. then we're not so far off in our ideologies and what we want in America. And, and, and that subject alone, but people's perspective of what secure means to them is different. How do you secure your own home? I have an alarm. I have a gate. Whatever the case, everyone chooses how they do that. When I grew up in LA, I didn't lock my doors in my car because I'd rather them open the door and not break my window. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. everybody has an yeah. idea of what they consider secure. Currently, you've seen the issues we have in our, in our, in our borders and not going into the political, ugh, the political madness of this all, but what are the concerns that you're seeing today from your experience and your expertise that the American people, the average person who probably ha is so far from the border, who does everything they can to just ignore it because the conversation is always an argument. What are some things that you really want to get them to start to understand and know about the, the, the severity and the issues that we have on our border? It's a great question. Great question. Um, first, is that they are witnessing the largest U.S. intelligence failure since 9-11, and it is impacting them and their families. What has happened is that the media, through their lack of understanding of what we're up against, look at the border through the lens of immigration. And there's many reasons for that. But as you just you know, really identified, that is one layer to a multitude of problems that are impacting us. And everything that I'm about and what I'm trying to do is expose what was a national security failure, which today it's, it's gone, it's over. And you're going to hear from a lot of so-called experts um, that we're dealing with a major national security failure well, or problem. National security is over. We opened our borders to the world. We are now in the realm of public safety domestically. And everything I am about now is about illuminating the public safety threat to the American people and everything we should be doing at local, state, federal, DOD, and U.S. intelligence agencies level is about staying left the boom because the problem now walks among us. And yes, definitely because of the immigration side, there are multiple layers of you know, trade craft from spies that have now entered the country. But when you really specialize about what the synergy is that has allowed all of this, while you can blame policy, you can do all of that, we have to look at what has taken place in Mexico with the evolution of these cartels from organized crime in 06 into an insurgency. That insurgency that I lived and breathed uh, up until 2010, where, you know, during the insurgency, we truly saw as the cartels fought back against the Mexican government, leveraging 50 caliber belt fed machine guns, armored vehicles, first, second generation. And today where we see them in, you know, fourth generation armored cars, the, the uh, RPGs, light anti-tank weapons, and that trade craft as the Zetas really transformed the capabilities of the cartels throughout Mexico. And then into terrorism from 2010, you know, the killing of innocent men, women, and children from Allende, 72 migrants massacred there, 300 men, women, and children of Allende. I worked all that, Vince. And um, then where we see them today truly as a parallel government. And what has happened around that is that they have become the nucleus. They are the synergy. And as we opened our borders to the world, what has not been told to the American people and where I'm so concerned about this is that you've got long haul smugglers now working side by side with the cartels who are also working side by side with state and non-state actors globally. Now the game has completely changed. 
Then when you start looking at how they control everything in Mexico with their networks and their alien smuggling organizations and the Halcon Network, who then collaborate throughout our nation with U.S.-based street gangs and what we call tier one gangs that impact multiple regions of the state, that is where we are in the national security failure that's now gone and in the public safety threat. Because as you know, as a border, former Border Patrol guy better than anybody, if you want to get into the United States, you have to work with one group, and that is the cartels, right? They yeah. have operational control of that country, and they own the plazas, and that, which are basically municipalities. And so if we're going to be successful, whether we're talking about stopping migrate, immigration, illegal immigration, if we're going to be, you know, stop the deadly fentanyl coming into the country, if we're going to stop um, uh, high values who are coming and working with them, we have to focus on the cartel specifically and their labs. Otherwise, where we are right now, get ready. If you think it's bad now, yeah, this is just the beginning of how bad it could be. I'm going to back you up for a second because, you know, for me, I, I understand a lot what you're talking about. I think sometimes the, the average end user might not. And so we'll, I'll ask for a little bit of clarification on a few things. When you say sure. yeah. national security failure, can you better explain what that means? And you're saying that the national security is, is, is no longer. And then you said well, now we're focusing on state uh, and state and local um, well, I don't know how you work. Sure. Right. Great, great question. Great question. And, I, and I'm glad you asked me to clarify that. When you think of national security nexus, the national security enterprise, the home, what I would call the Homeland Security Enterprise, its role and its function is to prevent the problem from getting here, right? That's the whole goal when you hear national security. We're preventing the issue from getting here. We fight it downrange, not at our borders. And as we open the world up to coming here at our southern border, at our coastal borders, at our northern border, but also what a lot of Americans are not aware of through the CBP-1 app. We've got them flying in now legally uh, into the United States at, at airports all over the country. So when you look at the scope of it, you know, that is why I say it's not about national security anymore. It's all about public safety. I mean, you know, look at the, look at the young girl that was just killed by a uh, individual who came here illegally from Venezuela. This is a great example of what I'm talking about. Think of all the sexual assaults that are occurring to people right now in women across our country that Americans aren't being told about. You know, DWIs with crashes killing families. This is all going to be illuminated. And for me, everything is about protecting the American people now and realizing that we are in a different world. We are not in the world of talking about national security anymore. We open it up to the world and the world's problems, and it's here. That walks among us, and we have to illuminate their operations and what they're doing. That's what I mean uh, when I say that the national security enterprise model has failed us, and that we're really witnessing the largest U.S. intelligence failure since 9/11. In in the the largest U.S. intelligence failure uh, since 9/11, and that and that is you're saying because the massive influx of immigration that has kind of gone on in the past several years, whatever your case you want to say but because of some of those outliers don't have good intentions for America. Is that, is that, is, like, a, if I were to. That's a, it's absolutely. So, so, and I'll give you a great example. And you know, this, um, what database do we check for Somalians that are coming in? I have no idea. <laughs> we don't, we don't have one. Yeah. What, what database do we check for Uzbekistanis? What database do we check for Chinese? What database do, it doesn't exist. Sure, we have some within the U.S. intelligence agencies where we can do voice recognition, but that's not what Border Patrol checks. Correct. You see, this is the story that hasn't been told to the American people. And so we truly open it up. And now that's the immigration side of it, right? Now, now let's go over to what the cartels are doing and how they move high values and how they coordinate those operations, leveraging the Halcom network all along our border. What do you see at the border? As you know better than anyone, they flood a zone thousands, hundreds of people at one time, right? Yeah. And then what happens upriver and downriver? That's where they then move runners, right? For, for whatever reason, they can't be in the country, but they move them to confirm that they can get in. Once they get in, then they move drugs, and then they move the high values, very coordinated operations. And when you peel back that layer, that onion of how coordinated these operations are and how the lifeblood of them um, leverages, you know, two-way handheld encrypted radios, some of them with global communications, the game has truly changed. And so that's where I'm talking about how we've opened up the border to the world's problems and they now walk among us. That's, uh, that's heavy. It is. But, you know, I don't just talk about it, I show it. Matter of fact, I sent you some videos uh, yeah. where you can see 
uh, a video that we broke literally today, this morning, of a Mayo Zambada gunman. What you're seeing is a forward operating base run by Mayo Zambada's faction of the Sinaloa cartel just across from Aravaca, Arizona. It's on the Mexico side, but it's 100 yards from your border. And as you see this video, you see a cartel gunman, and you see he's got two AK-47s, but that's not really the important part of this. It's the trade crap. Look at the handheld radio, the lifeblood of the organization. This is how they know when to move product, when the lane is open in the zone, as they call it, where the gate is wide open, because there's no border patrol agents, and then they'll move deadly drugs into the country, or they'll move bodies. And uh, I've even got video here for you of some of the drugs that they're moving in, and you can see these individuals here who are... Uh, a part of the organization whose job it is to, is to act as mules to move drugs into the country. If you look at the backpacks, you see the backpacks are square. The reason for that is that in this area, what they'll do is they'll take fentanyl and other controlled substances. They put it in Tupperware bowls and then they, they feel it with tape and they stack them. And then they just push them straight down into uh, the backpack, zip it up. That's how you know this, these are smugglers. I can't tell you what kind of drugs are in there. But I can tell you that those are definitely controlled substances. I've been working it since 1999. And, and that's also not going to be your normal marijuana. Those are usually moved in bundles, 100-pound right. bundles, 90-pound bundles. So anything that's compressed into a small backpack like that most likely is going to be your fentanyl, your you know, oxycodones, whatever it is that they're bringing. But it's going to be a, most likely a pill form or a powder form. And that means it's a very different drug and a very different danger to the, to the American people. Absolutely. I mean, look, that area is ground zero for moving in deadly fentanyl into the United States, impacting families all over this country at unprecedented levels. So, you know, I've interviewed several people, and it's funny because outside of the Mexican border, the smuggling and trafficking networks are not frowned upon by other countries. Essentially, a lot of those countries don't have illegal immigration clauses, or that doesn't it doesn't it doesn't affect them if someone. Trans, trans, uh, tries to move, you know, migrate north towards America. And so they view it almost as if a travel agency, you know what I mean? And supporting the movement of people and just making a payment, just getting a job and get and helping and assist people moving to America or transporting to America. It's when it gets into Mexico, things change dramatically. Is what you said is it's almost impossible for anyone to kind of come into America without being connected to some kind of cartel or some kind of trafficking organization. And has that been the case? How long has that even been a thing, that the cartels controlled movement from Mexico into America that you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I really began to understand it about 03, 04, to what degree uh, they were really beginning to take over in Mexico. But, to, but um, you know, in the old days, they didn't care about bodies. They didn't care about – and just so everyone's aware, that's a term law enforcement uses right. um, for people. Um, they didn't care about them. You know, I mean, they, they were a commodity for human smuggling, not trafficking. You know, you, you move, you agree to cross through my plaza. Okay. Give me a hundred dollars. I'm going to cross you at the border in South Texas. It's a hundred bucks. Nobody cared. And at the end of it, you were on your way and then you were passed off to somebody else and they, you know, paid their fee today. That's completely changed today. It's, it's trafficking. And so they have diversified the cartels. You know, we still think of them in the United States as these drug trafficking organizations. Right. That's the story that's not been told is they have diversified and are operating globally. You know, trafficking is a great example. Look, I broke this story in February of 21. These are wristbands, right? This is what I call America's new slave trade, Vince. Broke this in February of 21 as the Gulf cartel was so emboldened um, because it just as Border Patrol agents were dealing with overwhelming numbers, so were the, the Gulf Cartel. So they began putting these wristbands. Is that tell me when that's in focus? I oh, yeah, I see that. I old. see it. Yep. You see it. Um, and each one represents a different alien smuggling organization under the Gulf Cartel. They were so emboldened. They began putting these on men, women and children. You can see another one here. What, what for? Tell what are they what are they focus. using? What are they using wristbands for? But, because as they were being overrun with thousands of bodies. They couldn't keep up with who had paid the piece, which is what we call the tax. So they begin leveraging, literally putting these on them. And by the way, they, I'll never forget this. A Gulf cartel operative said to me, he said, Jason, people are the gift that keep giving because I can tell that commodity where to go. I can tell it what to do. I can make it move drugs. I can make it do anything I want it to do. So they said, my God, why don't we start charging them huge fees? So they began charging Mexican citizens $2,500. 
just across the river, Vince, yeah. in South Texas. I mean, that's unheard of, right? Yeah. Central Americans, 3,000. Chinese, 5,000. If you're a Russian or Middle Eastern, nine grand. Wow. It was a tectonic shift from their operations. That's why today Americans are told the cartels are making more money off trafficking of people at the southern border than they are anything else now. Well, no, not necessarily. At our border, yes. But when you look at their operations globally, we have to remember they make a lot of money moving dope to Europe. They make a lot of money moving dope to Australia. There was a time they were, uh, CG&G was making 180000 a kilo in Australia, Russia, 100000 they bombarded those two countries with so much. Now the numbers are way down. Um, but that's also how CJNG, Cartel Jalisco, New Generation, the most violent cartel in Mexico, rose to power so quickly. Remember, Mencho married into the Valencia family, right? The Valencia cartel who had operations globally. And so his wife and a lot of the family, that's where their operations were. And so they were charging way more than the U.S. economy. But like, you know, this is a story that's not told to the American people, yeah. and I get so frustrated. I, I, I tell you, I, I just I, sh I shake my head, man. I, you know, I heard uh, an interview from a, a Mexican journalist uh, that w we hope to get on the show here as well, and he said the cause and effect of us building the wall gave the cartel uh, means to now start charging serious money for trafficking because it was getting harder for the average person to cross, and so the cartel saw that as an opportunity and created a more solidified business because of that. And which is just fascinating to me is that, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not sure if what your take on that is, but that's from a Mexican journalist that I, I think is very fascinating and, and very intelligent dude. But I can see how making it harder to cross the border turned into a business for the cartel, for, for them yeah. to control it. If we had a border across the, the entire area, I would agree with that. The only reason I don't agree with that is because that's not what the cartel guys are telling me. Yeah. Right. And when you're down there on the border, the border's wide open to the American public. The border is not shut down in any way, shape, or form. It's more open today than I've ever seen it in my entire life um, during my career. So I don't, from what they tell me, they tell me it was just to the sheer influx. And you know how they are. They're going to make money off whatever commodity it is, whether it's a man, a woman, a child. They just saw a new avenue and they adjusted to it. So uh, I don't know. You know, that's an interesting take on it. I've not heard that uh, from the guys, but I'll reach out and ask them. I still uh, I have a lot of sources within the cartels and they tell me what they're doing. And that's how I go where I go. I get the videos that I'm showing yeah. you. Uh, I know exactly what they're doing and where some of their major operations are changing. And I try to get those videos out to the public. Jason, something that, you know, I'm kind of naive to since I've left the patrol in 2015, I'm naive to the shifts and changes in the cartel space. Um, for those who are listening who are probably completely naive to the whole concept, is there any way you can give us kind of a, a breakdown of the basics of who's kind of controlling the borders currently? Uh, or, or who's, sure. the, you know, yeah. that's something that, you know, I've kind of stayed or steered away from in my career. Just after I left, I was like, yeah. okay, keep moving, you know? <clears throat> well, you need to know really the big change is that the frontera, as we call it, you know, the area along our border region has always been considered by the cartels, the war zone. Uh, that or the front line. And so they would send their operatives up there to control that space because it's prime real estate. That's the way everyone needs to understand. And the plaza is really what they call a municipality for us in the United States. So, you know, Reynosa, for example, is a plaza across from McAllen or Miguel Aleman is a, pro, a, a, a plaza across from Roma, Texas. Really, it's a municipality. And so when you look at from Brownsville to Miguel Aleman, that is run um, or to Roma, Texas, that is run by Cartel de Gafo, known as CDG, one of the oldest, really, uh, really at one time, a very strong cartel. I worked them for years. From there over, uh, just a, a little further west from Del Rio, that is run by Cartel de Este, uh, formerly known as the Los Zetas. We worked them extensively. They were forced to rebrand or fall forever. That's how they became CDN. Then from there, you start to have La Línea, known as the Line, who used to be the Juarez Cartel. Uh, once you get to the plaza of Juarez, most of that is controlled by Chapo Guzman's, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, uh, Chapo Guzman's sons, Ivan, and the Los Chapitos cells. They run everything through Arizona all the way across, all the way to California. Wow. So the Sinaloa cartel really is the dominant cartel in control of those plazas. Now, you got a lot of infighting in Caborca. Um, the Salazar is a well-known family directly connected to Ivan through family and blood. 
Um, they are starting to break up, trying to get away from the Sinaloa a bit after four years of battling in Caborca and along those regions in Aravaca. That's why right now with the videos I showed you a little while ago, you got Mayo Zambada's cell there fighting the Chapito cells, the sons of Chapo Guzman. You know, there's some infighting there. It's been going on for about the last three and a half to four years. But that's how the makeup is. So it's, it's very easy to understand the trends that impact us and in, in the American people. Sinaloa is responsible mostly for deadly fentanyl flowing into the United States. Cartel Jalisco, new generation, the most hyper-violent cartel in Mexico, is really producing more deadly methamphetamine. They're second to fentanyl, and they're working side-by-side side, uh, in uh, along the border region with Cartel de Gafa, which is why Texas is now really getting hit hard with methamphetamine and deadly fentanyl in our, in our uh, part of the region. So where they operate, how they operate, really impacts different parts of the country based on their contacts with U.S.-based street gangs, Tier 1 gangs, and other organizations where they have control uh, domestically in the United States. I grew, I grew up in the Los Angeles, California area in, in the 90s, prevalent gang era, right? A lot of my friends were associated with gangs, my family, and, and whatnot. I've never heard of the term Tier 1 gang. Who would fall into the kind of the list of a Tier 1 gang? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, one, cartels, some of them. You know, the La Zetas is a great example. When you, okay, so let me, let me go into what is that. First off, in Texas, we created a criteria. What we recognize is that if you were going to work in the United States with the cartels, they were working with certain people. So we tiered them. And we said, okay, if you have operate in so many regions of the state of Texas, if you operate with so many operators, if you recruit juveniles domestically in our state, and if you have certain capabilities with certain cartels, then we're going to create a tiered program that would focus 2,600 law enforcement agencies in Texas, focusing on these priority targets domestically. MS-13 is a great example who's been contracting down there. Mexican Mafia. Look, Mexican Mafia's operations with the Zetas would stun the average American if they knew. Uh, in Texas, MA is what we call MA, which is Mexican Mafia. Their constitution is out of San Antonio. Yet they've been running operations with the Zetas going back that I can tell you for sure when I was stationed as a lieutenant in Laredo, Texas in 09. And they were literally doing hits, learning tradecraft, basic intermediate advanced training. They had cells in Laredo, Texas that were killing Americans throughout the country uh, for reduced loads of, of narcotics. And at the same time, they were operating in Mexico, supporting the Zetas operations. But yet they deconflicted out of San Antonio. So when I, ex when I tell you, you know, as a former law enforcement officer, how far behind the United States government is in illuminating to the American people the threat that we face from the cartels, tier one gangs, U.S. based street gangs, this is why I've come out to say we've got to designate them as terrorists and we've got to operate at a level we never have because the threat walks among us and it's just to our south. Yeah, you know, it's, you said that they train, you said intermediate and experienced, like, do they do military style training in these cartels and some of these tier one gangs? Oh yeah, absolutely. Nothing new there. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this. This is a really good, good question. The FARC, right? The FARC was a designated foreign terrorist organization under the United States government for many years under the Biden administration was just removed, but the FARC operating out of Colombia has been providing tradecraft and training to the Zetas for many, many years. This is well-documented. Anybody can Google this. Yep. Uh, the U.S. intelligence agencies know it. If you look at the Papa bombs that are made by CJNG, that tradecraft is directly coming from the FARC. And so, yeah, they've been working with them. Look at the Zetas. What were the Zetas originally? Let's really talk about that, right? They came from, um, from Mexican Special Forces, right? Um, and they were mostly Sedena operatives who came over, originally started with seven, then 14. That's where Mamito and many of the other guys came from. And they started working for OCL Cardenas as uh, enforcers. So, you know, OCL Cardenas used to say about the Zetas that, you know, they, they're my zapatas, right? They're my shoes. That's why they're called disease. A lot of them, people are not aware of that because he used to wear them like his shoes. They were his enforcement wing. And so... Working with special forces, that's where they gain tradecraft vents. You know, in the old days, you're going to go do a dope deal in South Texas. And, you know, we're going to do the deal at seven o'clock at night, right? In a parking lot of like HEB, or I'm going to buy 10 kilos of cocaine. We're on doper time, right? That's what we used to call it. I know you remember that term, yeah. right? And so we're, the dope deal may go down at two in the morning because, you know, they're sleeping all day from partying all night. There was no tradecraft. The Zetas were different. And what they brought to the Mexican cartels was tradecraft and discipline. When they said they were going to be somewhere at seven 
at six o'clock, they arrived ready to operate, ready to do what needs to be done, doing their secondary and third checks and operationalizing everything. This is why everybody wanted to be a Zeta. This is why they spread like a virus across Mexico. And the other cartels learned very rapidly, very quickly. Either you gain that same capability or that we are falling. And that's why enforcement wings across Mexico were developed within all of these cartels. And now what was violence at the frontera where the war zone traditionally was, now you see the violence across Mexico impacting Mexican citizens at a level that really, you know, we should be talking about on nightly news every single night. Yeah, I want to get into Mexico, but uh, we're going to have to circle to that later in a second, because you said something that kind of caught my attention. You said uh, they were doing hits in America. You see, mm -hmm. If these tier one gangs, these cartels doing hits in America, how come we don't hear about it often? How come I've never heard of a case that directly goes to the cartels association with setting up a hit? And, you know, like I've never. Look, I'm not a naive dude. I know there's things that are kind of shady that happen, and I see things like, man, that mm -hmm. seems a little odd, right? But publicly, the average person probably doesn't dig as deep as I do and also doesn't have the background I do to kind of associate and identify and things like that. And so how come us as American people have never heard of a cartel hit done in America? Oh, man, and it's happening all the time. I'll tell you a great story. I'm sitting in my office. I'm a captain in the Texas Rangers Border Security Operations Center and a, a guy who works in a unit that I'll never be able to talk about publicly. It's, it's, a, it's one of the most secretive units within the department uh, who worked for me. I created the unit. He comes to me and he says, hey, Cap, we got a problem. I said, what is it? He said, um, we've got a murder in South Lake, Texas. This is 2013. I said, well, why is that a problem? He said, because the FBI, the DEA, and HSI is on scene. I said, oh, shit, we got a problem. So get up there. The ranger calls down and says, uh, we just had a hit of a cartel lawyer take place in the middle of one of like South Lake, Texas, for everybody that's listening right now, South Lake, Texas is like, you know, the high end area. And what they leveraged was incredible. They, they, um, they've been looking for this lawyer who had worked for the Gulf cartel for many years. He'd been in hiding and, um, his family members who lived in Florida, uh, the cartel knew about them. And so they began putting tracking devices on their vehicles. And for months, they followed this family and they finally located him and they executed him in the mall. That was the first one that I got. The second one I got, give you another example. Sit in my office again, because you know, I'm a captain, that's what you do, right? And I'm drinking coffee and uh, same agent walks in, he says, hey, we got a problem. So what, what problem we got? He said, there's a body with no head uh, floating in the intercoastal down near uh, Port Isabel. And I said, yeah, that's a problem. He said, the ranger just called and said, they want some help. Um, can't find the head. I said, absolutely. An hour later, our sources within the Gulf cartel, we solved that case. Um, a guy had been stealing cocaine out of tires that he was putting into the tires. Because as you know, you know, a lot of the tire locate, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, tire places down there, the fixed flat tires s smuggle a lot of yeah. drugs in, in these tires. And anyway, they caught him stealing it, shot him in the head in the facility. And we ran, we ran a search warrant, hit it with luminol, which is a laser, laser basically with light. And then if there's any blood, it'll just light up like a, I mean, it's incredible. And solve that case like that. You know who the shooter was? Who? Border Patrol, Border Patrol agent. Working directly for the Plaza Boss with CDG. This is 2015. Anybody watching right now? Just Google it. 2015. Uh, I believe his name was Luna. He was a Border Patrol agent. He had access to all sensor data with Border Patrol and with my agency of DPS. So here's where I'm going with this to answer your question. Why do the American people not know? The system that we had in place under the FBI was called the Uniform Crime Reporting System. And so it captures murders, but it doesn't capture murders directly linked to transnational crime. So everything you and I are talking about, that murder was captured, but it wasn't captured directly linked to a cartel member. And what do we always say in law enforcement? Oh, it's law enforcement sensitive. We can't tell you. So years go by, and finally, the cases are resolved. The media is able to get it out, and then no one reads it. Or if they do read it, they don't, they don't talk about it because it's a case that's years old. So I, what I want everyone to understand, when we talk about the impact of transnational crime upon the American people, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, human, tra human trafficking, human smuggling, money laundering, extortion, and the long list, list of transnational crime, none of that is captured under the Uniform Crime Report. And where we always thought it was a left or a right issue, but it was really a failed reporting model. 
Now the FBI, as of 2021, has gone to what they call the National Incident-Based Reporting System, known as NIBRS. It captures 52 new index crimes, and it helps. But here's the problem, Vince. Most law enforcement in the country won't go to it because it's too intensive in the collection of data. So it's a data collection issue overlaid with a failure of, of the media to understand and to be able to work with law enforcement because law enforcement doesn't want to work with them. That's why I embed with them now, coming with my background to really illuminate the operations and the impact to the American people. This is how we've had 112,000 overdose deaths in this country. And we're seeing things we've never seen before. I, I, look, I, I'm going to say it again and again. We are witnessing the largest U.S. intelligence failure since 9-11. And Americans feel it in every state across the country. <laughs> this is uh, it's heavy. It's a lot to unpack. And it's, um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not naive to it completely. I've just kind of steered away from bogging my brain with too much of this because there's so many other things on my list that I'm trying to focus on. But... It's important for us to, to understand that. It's important for us to know. What it sounds like to me is anyone that might be in potential, I guess, a threat of being, you know, killed potentially by the cartel, it's someone who's probably associated. So that makes me understand that those of us who are not associated in that space, is it still a threat to us? Yes, Absolutely. Everything is transitioning. You know, I, I, you know, that was another thing that we always hear is, yeah, well, that's because they were involved in the drug trade, right? I mean, that, that's what we would, right. we, would, we would bounce that off to that. Okay, well, what if my wife or your wife or our loved ones walking down the street and get hits with those ricocheted rounds? Yeah. Look, if, let, me, let me answer it this way. If Americans watching right now are wondering where this ends, let me tell you where it ends. All you have to do is look to Mexico to see what is coming here. And as we have opened up our borders, the cartels operate in all 50 states in this nation. They operate in every major city. They operate in every county. There are tens of thousands of them that walk among us. And the hyperviolence and the tradecraft of Mexico is coming here. I, I break these stories all the time as they're rolling down the interstate with a 50 caliber um, sniper rifle, chest rigs. On Interstate 10 in Arizona. I mean, I, I have break so many stories now, it's hard for me to even keep up with it because unless you watch Newsmax or unless you watch what I'm posting on social media, Americans don't feel it. And they they won't stop, Vince. They can't stop because they're worried about their rivals. And Americans have to understand the threat we face. And this is all I focus on. This is all I do now. Yeah. Jason, it's, it's incredible to hear. And it's, you know, I think some would almost feel that is this not conspiracy, but fear mongering, but it's not, it's like you, you, you post it, you show it. <laughs> the, the evidence is there. I, I don't blame them. They've been lied to by every news media in the country, right? A lot with good intentions or half truths. You know, let me, let me tell you how the media works today. Cause I'm in it. And I have been for a while. They don't have the money, Vince. They don't have the money. So they send a, a, a young journalist to the border or senior journalist. They go to the border. They're not familiar with it. So they don't know where to go. But they hear there's a big group crossing over here. So what do we see every night on national news? They go to that big group. They stick a microphone in the migrant space and they say, tell me your story. And I'm not saying that's not a story. It is. And it's an important one. But when you peel back the onion, you look at the level of trade craft. These cartels don't operate with a born to lose tattoo stamped on their forehead. These people are living and breathing it every day. And if you and I were talking to them right now, and I talk to them all the time. They are at war, and from their perspective, and their perspective matters, they are concerned about their rival, Vince. They're not concerned about the United States government because we've done nothing to them, and they're not concerned about the Mexican government. And this is why you see a continued evolution in violence in Mexico and in deaths in the United States. And let me just give you a couple quick examples. Look at deadly fentanyl in the United States. We've gone from regular fentanyl that we never had a problem with in this country until 2015 to parafentanyl, serafentanyl, now we're mixing in xylazine and metazine, right? Why? Because as one cartel developed fentanyl, the other came in and said, oh my God, I've got to get something better because they're, gonna, they're making too much money here, right? And so it just keeps getting worse and worse. Look in Mexico. One cartel develops, a, the, remember the monsters back in the day in yes. 2012 when we were working? Remember the monsters? They just slapped these big, big pieces of metal on them. Then what do we see? Second generation, third generation. What were the second generation of big boxes? Smaller, more F-350 types, you know what I mean? Yep. One ton trucks, because they were learning as they were battling that mobility was life. And now you see them even in half, CDN, 
uh, the troops of hell, their enforcement wing, they use half ton pickup trucks. They just slide in body armor, already constructed body armor into these things. So they can't stop is what I'm, and I, and I, I testified before Congress in July of this. If anyone watching right now thinks that they're going to stop, you have to understand from their perspective, they're at war. They're concerned about being overrun by their rivals. Everything is about making more money and a better product and having a better capability than their rival. Otherwise, they could lose their territory and the people they love the most. And their perception matters. As much as we think we're so strong here in the United States, they operate at a level that is stunning. This is how they become a parallel government in Mexico. This is how the Sinaloans are in 54 countries and CJNG is in 48. So I, I want everyone to understand this won't stop because they can't stop. And why I'm trying to get new authorities with the terrorism designation and leverage uh, network theory and keynotes to go after them, hunt them down like the dogs they are, and truly not just disrupt them, destroy them for what they've done. Are you, are you ever uh, scared for your own life, being involved this deep into this? You know, there will come a time. Um, I've had several death threats. Do you remember the video of CJNG? With their armored vehicles, they were all in a line. It's, yeah. it's People have seen it. I mean, it's, it's had millions and millions of views all over the world. I got that from a Sedena uh, soldier who was in a Tier 1 unit. He sent that to me. When I put that out, um, that was the first death threat I've gotten. I've gotten many. Uh, if you notice how I operate, I, I use a lot of tactics as much as I can. But look, you're never too bad. You can't be had. These people are no joke. Yeah. They are no joke. And uh, I, know the, I know the threat I'm up against. But here's the problem. doesn't matter. I'm an old man. I'm 51 years old. Um, I'm more concerned about my country, our fellow citizens, and this nation ending up like Mexico is. Mexico is an gr- amazing country. It's got amazing people down there, and we have to get them their country back because it's been taken from them as the highest levels of the Mexican government have been corrupted. And look, for the folks watching right now, uh, I started what I'm doing because of what happened uh, with these migrants being killed. The awards behind me here are saving the lives of Mexican citizens and migrants in Mexico. There's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I work seven days a week. I know what's coming, Vince. If you think the 400,000 dead Mexican citizens since 2007 is where this ends, I want to be very clear, it is not. If you think the 100,000 dead Americans for overdoses is where this ends, this is just the beginning for us. And the longer our government and the Mexican government and governments around the world wait, they rise at a level and continue to rise to a level we've never seen. We know Mexico has almost no ability to change this. Every time they put someone into power that tries to, they get killed, they get, you know, assassinated, and so on and so forth. So Mexico themselves is almost, they can't, they, they can't, their hands are tied on this subject. Is that potentially what's happening here currently in America as well? Has the cartel infiltrated America at the highest levels potentially to the point where, where we ourselves are kind of at liberty to them? It's a great question. I, I get asked this a lot, and I don't believe that. Um, I don't. Let me tell you what I see. And I, you're talking to somebody that has briefed state leaders across the country, elected leaders, senators, congressmen, privately on both sides. And you're going you're gonna to be stunned when I find Do you know what I asked them now before I, before I brief them on what's, what's happening? That? When was the last time you were briefed, either classified or unclassified, by U.S. intelligence agencies or federal law enforcement on what has taken place in Mexico? You know what the answer is? Zero. Zero. And one guy... One guy said he was briefed by a CBP agent who hadn't worked the border in 10 years. Mm. This is where we are. Now, a lot of them go to the border and they take a, a, a tour. So if you're, if you're, but that's not a, that's not a cartel briefing. You yeah, see no, what I'm getting at in yeah. the evolution of them. So that's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. On the left, what I hear is they get their intel from MSNBC and CNN. On the right, Fox News. And so what I've truly learned is they don't know Vince. Yeah. The leaders of this country don't know. And when they try to get briefings, they can't get them. Now, if you're a part of certain subcommittees, you're getting those briefings. But you got to remember, that's a very small uh, grouping of leadership within the Senate and within the, the House. So what I find is most of them truly don't know. So they watch what they see on news and then they repeat it because they themselves don't know. And so that's why we're doing what I'm doing. Look, I'm, I'm a part of Border 911, some of the best in the country. 
And uh, we're trying to do everything we can to brief these leaders and get out what's happening um, to show it. You see the massive influx happening currently. We see the numbers of not your normal, you know, OTMs with the Border Patrol calls that other than Mexicans, not your normal Mexicans, but now we have the exotics through the roof. Is there a fear for you outside of the cartel side of things, but those outliers who potentially want to bring harm to America? Oh, absolutely. Um, look, we've had, if I remember correctly, and I'm going off memory here, just for all the folks watching, I think we're at 340 uh, under this administration that have crossed. Now, when our, to put that into perspective. 340, across, 340 what? I'm sorry. Pe people on the terrorism watch list who crossed your southern border, just your southern border, just your southern border. And the reason that number matters is because those are the ones that subverted law enforcement working with the cartels and the alien smuggling organizations. You see what I mean? Right. Um, where we have a lot that fly in, but they don't even know they're on the list. Um, and we catch them, you know, through, through checks when they're flying into the country. The ones that really matter are the ones that know they're on it and are subverting it. And the reason that number is important is because, you know, under the Obama administration, when I was running the Texas Rangers Cross Border Operations Center, in his worst year, we had six. And my unit caught five of them. Hmm. Yeah. We, uh, so, look, we've had almost two million known Godaways, Vince. Yeah. How, uh, I mean, those are known, never mind the ones we don't know about. Yeah. So, make no doubt. You know, the world now knows that if you want to get into the United States, the borders are open. You can send whatever spies, whatever tradecraft, whatever people you want into this country. And they're here. And this is why I say, I go back to what I said earlier. We're worried about national security. Well, you can give that one up. The problem is now here and it walks among us. And it is all about public safety and getting these bad actors who want to hurt Americans and our fellow citizens out of this country as, quite, as fast as we can. This is one of those questions that I get all the time, and I, it's almost impossible to answer, but how do you fix it? First, designate the cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. What you get from that is the authorities we need. So first, many of these cartel members are here on a visa, or they're here illegally. If you're a terrorist, I can revoke your visa very rapidly, very quickly, and remove you from the country, or if you're here illegally. Do you, you see what I mean? That puts speed in the system. Outside this country, what that gives us, and I want to stress that, Fourth Amendment domestically, we're always going to leverage, and we want that, the Fourth Amendment in this country. But outside, it gives us speed into the system. Now, you can't fly to these other countries. I'm limiting their mobility to Mexico. And then third, and I laugh about this all the time because, you know, you hear from these so-called experts, you know, we need to go after the money. No shit. <laughs> we all know that. We've been doing it for 20 years. You know what the American people haven't been told, Vince? is how through an investigative model, which is the strategy that we use globally, not just domestically, it takes time. Our system moves very slow and we want it that way when our government comes after us. So now this is gonna allow us to go after their assets real time. And the major fix to this is the unified command. That means we're gonna work globally with an entire group of the best of the best in the business from US intelligence agencies, foreign intelligence agencies, and the clandestine services. And we're going to leverage network theory. Not, we're not, it's not about dropping bombs and going to war about the cartels. It's about disrupting the networks. And I, I don't talk about that publicly very much. But basically, what I do say publicly is that each cartel is different. So the Zetas, when we took down the Zetas, they were very hierarchical. Why were they that way? Because they came from the military. So when we attacked key nodes at the top levels, it had a major impact. When you look at CJ and G or the Sinaloans, they're comp their model is completely different, Vince. So we want to leverage a different capability going after those key nodes, if you will, taking away their capability. Um, so some are hub, spoke, wheel, or mesh networks. And based on that, that's how you win. Uh, the last thing is that we're going to have to get real aggressive and real tough. And I truly mean that. Um, we're up against a foe that fights every day. They are at war every day. And they are no joke. And what I would tell you is this, and I mean this to the very core of who I am, they have hurt a lot of people. I mean, hurt them bad. Look at the families in our own country that are suffering from the loss of fentanyl and deadly drugs. Mexico, those, those poor folks down there, their story can't even get out. So I want to say this, and I mean it. I'm not going to stop. We are not going to stop until we get the authorities we need 
and to these cartels for what they have done to so many Mexican families, so many American families, and to people around the world. We are bringing the, together the unified command of the world's best, and God help them. And I mean that, because there will be nowhere on planet Earth these bastards can hide for what they've done to so many people. It's coming. We're not going to quit till we get it, man. Period. Thank you for listening to Borderland, an ironclad original. You know, throughout the years of me talking about the Border Patrol and writing about the Border Patrol, uh, if you look deep into it, you're always going to find Jason Jones somewhere uh, doing his journalism. And I have been a fan of his work for, for many years. And to be able to interview him today uh, was very special for me. Uh, this is a man who's done the work, who's been involved in this uh, for many years. And he is an expert in this field. And just to hear him speak today on this topic, it was eye-opening.